We've got several very experienced surgeons in the audience, so what I'd quite like to do is to throw out a few points and questions, and then perhaps we can have a little discussion about it, because it really is, um, you know, the, the, the bad end of the spectrum of right-sided disease. That is the patient who's been submitted to left-sided surgery, and uh, often within two or three years is back with severe right-sided dysfunction and severe tricuspid regurgitation and what to do about it. Um, as early as uh, um, 1950, um, Brownwald wrote um, about functional tricuspid regurgitation. And, of course, this was right at the birth of cardiac surgery. And in the early days, I think because survivorship across the board was pretty low, uh, if you got through your primary operation and went on for a few years, you'd done very well. So there wasn't an awful lot of recognition of what we now know is the malignancy of uh, long-standing, untreated right-sided problems. And it bred this sort of idea, and I remember it when I was in training at uh, Brompton and so forth, that most uh, patients with mitral surgery alone, uh, when that was treated, the TR would resolve or at least reduce. And we do see that, of course, um, but it's not a routine thing. And when you start to look through the data and the literature, the persistence of significant TR leading to deteriorating right ventricular function is extremely worrying. Um, so this idea it could be left um, was out there. Again, Carpentier, um, so sort of um, prevalent in so many of these rethinks on, on ideas, in the late 60s wrote about the impact of ongoing TR and uh, suggested that really we ought to be doing something about it. Um, those of you who are here this morning, Patrick, we referred to it, and uh, those of who went to the early mitral valve courses with Carpentier remember saying, him saying on Passant that in a woman who put in a, a 28 and in a man a 32 ring and it'll work for everybody. Well, we know that's not true either. So uh, just a few thoughts on this. Um, as more patients are surviving and midterm and late deaths through functional TR and right heart failure is increasing, we've got to rethink this. Um, it's not a nice condition to be presented with. These patients often have ascites, severe peripheral edema, uh, and are extremely symptomatic and not in great clinical condition. And reoperation in this group of patients, when you look across the board, as high as 30% mortality is frequently quoted. But of course, it's such a, a multifarious group of patients. There's every sort of um, one from the relatively early stage, the ones who really are inoperable, included in these series. And more people had a more liberal approach to repairing at the time of the initial operation. So we went from not really doing anything to, oh, let's do a tricuspid repair while we're there. Now, does that do any good? Well, we probably then are operating on some who don't need it. And, of course, as we mentioned again this morning, in every series, uh, there's up to 15% recurrence of TR, even in the presence of tricuspid repair at the time of surgery. Any etiology of tricuspid regurgitation is associated with reduced survival, and this was shown in that paper in Journal of Medical College of Cardiology in 2004. One-year survival with TR, 64%, and without, at 90%, adjusted for LV and right ventricular function, and these are patients with primary left-sided problems. So it does have a big impact. It drags your figures down significantly. There are contrary studies. Lee et al. reported 75% five-year survival in patients with untreated moderate or severe TR, although survival was worse when pulmonary hypertension was taken into account as well. But again, as I think the whole day has exhibited, assessing right ventricular function with or without pulmonary hypertension is still not well worked out. Now, the outcomes of tricuspid valve surgery are also not terribly clear. There's no randomized prospective data to guide us whatsoever. There may be a tendency towards reduced symptoms, but little or no evidence of improved survival. And here, survival bias is profound. I and mean, the ones we operate on are almost always different to the ones we don't operate on. And certainly when they come back with secondary problems, that is true. Um, this is the recurrence of TR over time after a primary operation. As you can see, it gradually progresses uh, uh, independent of the type of repair that's done, the vagas, perigars, flexible rings, rigid rings. It appears that the rigid flexible rings do best 
But it, with any kind of approach to this problem, these patients do go on and get progressive problems. So the way forwards, and this is a bit of an appeal really, we do need a randomized trial. Now we've been trying to put together a trial at our institution, multi-center, as some of the audience know, uh, and we keep getting batted back with rather interesting criticisms. The last one came back saying, um, we really think that this should be a multi-center trial so we can get a, a good assessment, and indeed it's put together as a multi-center trial. And then about four paragraphs down, the reviewers say, but we're worried about the standardization of surgery in a multi-center trial. So even the, you can actually see the discussion going around the table when they're reviewing the grant application. And uh, it is a really thorny issue. How do you define the patient groups? How do you standardize the surgery? And how do you assess the outcome? Almost every one of those groups of questions is not satisfactorily answered. And we're really struggling. We're determined we're going to submit again, because I really do think this needs to be done. And I hope those of us, those of you who've kindly suggested your help and be an important part of this, will hang in there with us. I've talked to our professor of surgery, Andrew Bradley, who sits on many of these meetings. He said, hang in there. It took him three years to get the last grant through. So maybe we'll get there in the end and we can do the work. So the problems to be addressed are who do we repair? mild, moderate, or severe TR? How do we define moderate TR? And how do we link into that the state of right ventricular function? What style of repair do we employ? And how do we assess the outcome with degree of left ventricular dysfunction, which is an independent predictor of outcome? So who do we repair? Well, I think by the end of today, we're beginning to get some kind of idea in terms of orifice size. We need to do work on coaptation height right ventricular function or dysfunction, probably looking at preservation of long axis contractile shortening, the presence or absence of pulmonary hypertension, I think I've just said, and in addition, complete correction of left-sided problems. So there is something to go on in terms of deciding who we repair. The Dreyfus paper is such an important part of this where he showed what many of us have felt, and that is this increase in orifice size beyond 7 centimeters in the diagonal uh, view or four centimeters anterior to posterior in the echo view uh, is an important cutoff point. But again, it's not the simple and sole determinant because you have to look at leaflet surface area and coaptation height as well. So I think again out of today, there is a bit of a consensus coming around this room and the people who have been here. We should start looking at coaptation heights of normal tricuspid valves and see if we can learn something there. The assessment of right ventricular function with dynamic studies and MRI and so forth uh, needs to be done as well. The annulus I've mentioned, annular size, um, and the effects of right ventricular dysfunction on annular function and uh, ventricular shape is particularly important. But there are a number of patients without annular dilatation at the time of mitral surgery who go on to develop significant TR which is why I say again, and forgive me if I repeat myself, but I think an assessment of right ventricular function in these patients is so important because it is absolutely mirroring functional mitral regurgitation and left-sided function. You know, the valve is only the sign of the problem. The problem is the ventricle, and there's more than one cause of right ventricular uh, distension. It's not clear that tricuspid repair in patients after primary mitral valve surgery significantly alters their outcome, as I've said. Significant TR has been noted late after surgery in up to 40% of patients, and the mortality is high. So it um, is worth looking at this in, in more uh, detail. Why should late TR surgery be any different from late MR surgery and its effect on maintaining and restoring ventricular function? In other words, we should probably think about them in the same way and how we assess ventricular function uh, should, could be applied to both sides. All the knowledge about right ventricular function suggests that the RV is even more of a sensitive structure than the LV. So when to go back? Well, um, before the onset of advanced heart, uh, heart failure, that is for sure. If you're offered a patient with severe ascites, severe edema, a large distended, barely moving right ventricle, it's too late. And even if you get them off the operating table, the chances of making any difference to their quality of life is very small. You can do studies of contractile shortening, uh, residual long axis shortening, as I said, and certainly all that, that, that should be done and early intervention considered if there's moderate or more TR. I would begin to think even mild TR of the dilating right ventricle. As I mentioned to you this morning, the paper by Hoffman showing ventricular size 
more than shape, determines long-term ventricular function. Now, Schaff in this paper in Circulation 2011, so Herzl Schaff, a recent one, and um, Patrick referred to it this morning again, repair or replace. And I think most of us in this room have kind of had our faces turned against replacement. We sort of worry about putting a valve in there. But we heard from Sarah in terms of the congenital work that they're not so frightened to do this. And they're getting in the very young group, which is the one you expect the tissue valves to fail quickest in, really quite good 10 and 12 year survivorship. Now, if our patients who've got such severe left sided dysfunction that has caused significant right sided dysfunction can have a valve that will last 10 years, that will last most of them for what life they've got left, actually, if you look at the survival curve. So, my tri tricuspid valve replacement, I think, needs another look. In this shaft paper, the sole independent predictor of death was NYHA class 4. And the main factors guiding the, the decision to replace was marked apical displacement of the tricuspid valve, which reflects long axis stretching, torrential TR, and severe right ventricular dysfunctional dilatation. And once that had occurred, it doesn't recover and is an independent predictor of outcome. So that we're beginning to understand the ones we really shouldn't operate on. Early intervention in the presence of ongoing, certainly moderate TR, whilst you've got preservation of right ventricular function, is the time to go. So we need, just like in the carcinoid group, to go around the oncologists. Here we need to go down the cardiology clinics because these are just the patients who sit there year after year after year. They run out of medical therapeutic options and they come knocking on your door saying, Frank, can you do this patient when the ankles are out here and the liver's pulsating down there? So. Um, I think I'll stop there. There are, there are techniques short of replacement we could discuss, but it would be very nice to hear what other people think and other people's experiences are, and uh, particularly what you think about the reintroduction of tricuspid valve replacement in these patients. Thank you, Frank. I think that's beautifully encapsulated the, all of the problems that we've been discussing throughout the day. So... I throw it open to the floor if there's any comments or questions or areas for discussion. A number of years ago, I reviewed the, uh, the experience with redo valve surgery from Belfast, and we found you know, about 700 patients. We had a smaller proportion, obviously, of tricuspids within that, but this figure of around 40% with the worst outcome, worse than prosthetic valve endocarditis at other sites and so forth, was a glaring uh, fact from the paper. So I, the cardiologists obviously have a real problem and they're all coming to us telling us about this population of patients and yet perhaps we all need the encouragement that uh, if we get the timing right in the intervention in these patients and perhaps get in earlier, um, they do seem to be a, a cohort of patients that are ripe for, uh, for getting a benefit from. So very enthusiastic with the idea of trying to... Uh, to do something in this, in this cohort? Well, I think we're, we're very well placed for that right now. It's going to be a two-fronted assault, isn't it? The first is trying to make the right decision the first time round, so, and we're getting to start to think about that, and data is beginning to accrue. It would be nice to have some randomized data. And secondly, getting the message out there and the sort of paper you're referring to, and, and maybe more of us should look and write it up, emphasizing to the cardiologist that if this is an ongoing problem, don't despair come and talk to us early. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. So a sort of two-pronged attack is what we need. Any other comments? Can I ask you, have you ever turned down a patient who has got a left-sided uh, de degenerative valve but has got severe RV dysfunction? Have you turned that patient down for surgery? Yes, I have, yeah. And, um, and on, on what criteria did you use in your head? Apart oh, on from, right ventricular dysfunction. Yeah, this, I remember the patient well. It was not that long ago. Um, she'd had previous surgery, and had aortic valve surgery had severe mitral valve disease, um, and it had left over a long period of time. And uh, her right ventricle was in a terrible state. We, we, we looked through MRI, recruitable myocardium, and all the rest of it. We looked at the left side. Um, she was a delightful, very educated woman. We sat down and had a long talk about it, and... Um, her son was a lawyer, her husband was a judge, um, and uh, my partner knows I came home sort of scratching my head what to do about this, and I said no with a heavy heart. 
And then the son wrote to me saying, look, you really do mean no, do you? My mother's wonderful. And I said, okay, I'll think again. And I got her back and we repeated the MRO functional assessments. It was no better than the first time down. And uh, I spoke to her again and she was incredible. She sat down and said, young man, which made me feel wonderful, you've thought very hard about this. We've discussed it at length. I'm going to go and read more Keats and Browning and enjoy the sunshine. Steve at the back. Frank, thank you again. Just to talk about your repair, stroke, replace question. The one or two instances in the last few years I've had fingers burned with attempting a tricuspid annuloplasty in multivalve mm -hmm. surgery and having early, i.e. intraoperative residual TR. It's the patients with RV dilatation. And it, my, my interpretation is simply if you've got a big, big right ventricle, even if there is enough function to recover, as the heart fills, the leaflet tethering will give you recurrent Absolutely. TR, and you can make the island just as small as you like. It, it doesn't help. So I think the places to go for elective TVR, and I use a bioprosthesis, is in the patients with a biggish heart with lots and lots of TR when you really need to get a good result. Steve, you wanted to come in? Can you put your last slide on? Because yeah. That's, could, that's could, actually not as complicated as it looks. Exactly. Mr. Projectionist, Stuart, yeah. could you put my last slide up? <clears throat> Thanks. Just while the slide's coming on, I know you were saying that Patrick Perrier was being quite brave to, to talk about replacing at an earlier stage, but we actually had Tyrone David over last year, and he was saying exactly the same mm. thing, and his number of replacements in exactly that situation mm. is going up and up and up. It's, it's, we, we are mirroring about two years behind, yeah. and we're not there yet, left-sided mitral yeah. valve insertion. Steve, yeah. I, I mean, I think this is a very elegant operation yeah. for, for where you've got extreme tethering of the valve. Yeah. I don't claim an enormous personal experience, but it's not a difficult operation. Exactly. Um, and it, it, it does allow you to get uh, good competence in these uh, dilated right ventricles yeah. with, without splinting the right ventricle open with that mm. big circular prosthesis. And I think it's worth reading these articles and looking yeah. at and thinking about trying it because it's not that difficult. And Co core, core matrix is lovely if you choose to do this. Yeah. Mm. Totally agree with you. And the tip, having done it a number of times now, make the patch a lot bigger than you think. Make the patch enormous, yeah. yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Because the whole of the carptation surface becomes the old anterior leaflet. Yes. Yeah. And the, mm. more you, the bigger you make it, you've got uh, room for the point that you're making. As the ventricle dilates, you've got a lot of carptation to use up before you run out, as it were. Mm. So I, 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 I put that in for that reason. So I'm glad you picked that up, yeah. One of the other difficulties, and I think you spoke about it, is, is the tricuspid valve that isn't leaking, but you think the annulus is a bit dilated and the valve's not coapting. Mm. And we've talked about intervening in those patients for the long term, but actually I think there's probably a, a, a good indication in the short term because particularly if they've got pulmonary hypertension, etc., TR can be a very dynamic mm. process in those patients. And I get the feeling that it makes their post-operative management a little bit easier if you've eliminated the possibility of this functional severe TR. So I don't know if, if anybody else would yeah. put that in as an indication for doing it. Yeah, the, the, you're absolutely right. And, but when you look at the echo in many of these patients with no TR, there's often mm -hmm. virtually no coaptation. And I think, well, I now repair those. I put a ring in those um, every time. And I work very hard to make the mitral valve completely competent. The other group of patients, too, I'd, I'd invite you to go away and look at are the Barlow's mitrals. The tricuspid valve is often doing the same thing. It's mm. prolapsing, and the base of the ventricle is moving outwards. And it's interesting when you correct the Barlow's on the left side, the ventricle starts to move normally. And my experience now when I've been dealing with this on the right side, the right, same thing happens there. So you get an enhancement of basal right ventricular function in correcting those valves early. But go and have a look if you haven't noticed it. Every Barlow's valve you look, look at the, in the four-chamber view, look at the tricuspid valve as well. And you, if you haven't noticed it, you may be surprised. It's there on that side as well. Any other burning questions or issues? If not, I think we can finish the session. And thank you to all the speakers. And amazingly, we finished on time. Thank you.